about it because first he did just physically bump into me and my wife and my son is sitting there watching. So I can't not do anything about it. And it really, it doesn't matter if the size of the guy or how big he was, or if he's all roided out. It really doesn't matter. The situation doesn't, you don't get to choose who the enemy is. You don't get to choose who attacks you or who tries to rob you. You, unfortunately, you don't get to choose even how many of them are when they do it, but you need to know how to respond to it, react to it. It's wrong in a gym, but no, I'm going to show my son how a man really should act, not how a man might want to act. We all have that dark passenger inside of us, that beast, that monster. We need to know how to control that monster. That is the ultimate emotional discipline. Knowing how to control that monster, that beast, that dark passion that's in you as a man, that's testosterone fueled, especially in the gym and you're, you're flowing. That is the ultimate level of emotional discipline, of self-regulation. What's up, freaks? Welcome to another episode of the Steve Eckert Show podcast. And today we're going to talk about one of the most important things for men, and that is regulating, controlling your emotions, specifically having emotional discipline and emotional resiliency. We're going to break it down, give you examples of real world examples of when I've had to demonstrate and deal with that, and then actual strategies and tactics how to maintain your balance your bearing and have that emotional discipline and emotional resiliency that we're talking about. The Steve Eckert Show is a show on how to flip the switch and have a no excuses, badass mindset guiding you to adapt, overcome, and destroy the obstacles that are preventing success in your mindset, your family, your fitness, and your business so you can stop being a little bitch, get your shit together, and start living life on your own freaking terms while you create your own personal ideal freak freedom lifestyle. This is all about transforming men and women from where they are to where they want to be, need to be, and freaking de- deserve to be. And this is about learning to weaponize everything, weaponizing failures, tra- tragedy, victories, obstacles, weaponizing your weaknesses, about flipping the switch and showing you how to operate to dominate in your mindset, your family, your fitness, and your business. And today, we are talking about emotional discipline, controlling your emotions, regulating your emotions. Because listen, the, the difference between a man and a boy is the control of their emotions. Let me say that again for you. Really, the difference between a boy and a man is a boy is unable to control their emotions and a man is able to control his emotions. That is a difference. That is a major difference. And unfortunately, these days, most men are un- unable to control their emotions and they just go around acting like little fucking boys, little bitch boys. That's what goes on. And, and they go, you see it everyday life especially in this internet age and social media age where people are just on the keyboards getting emotional and, and, and get offended by everything that happens. Anything you say, they get instantly triggered and everything is politically incorrect and everything offends people. It's freaking crazy. And we're, this isn't to say that men shouldn't have emotions or, or be robots or zombies, but they definitely need to know how to control those emotions, need to know how to dis- have discipline, how to, how to stay centered, we call it maintaining your bearing. Think about bearing, like a military bearing in the military. Bearing is one of the leadership traits that the Marine Corps has. And a mil- military bearing is your outward appearance that, that would be including your uniform, your hair, your grooming standards, the, the amount of motivation they have and the pride in their appearance, the pride in the way they walk and talk and show up. It's also the way they may, may t- that you maintain your composure and, and contain your emotions and control and maintain your emotions at all times, maintaining that bearing. That's what bearing is all about. Military bearing is the same as maintaining your bearing, the same as emotional discipline, controlling that bearing, that balance. I hate to use the word balance, but just for the, to give it context, to maintain that balance, that control. Military bearing is, is a demonstration of just confidence. So emotional discipline is, is really a, a level of confidence and discipline and attitude in everyday life. And it's both when you're in personal life or professional life or in the military, it's on duty and off duty. Same thing. You should never lose your bearing just because you're not in your professional life, in your personal life. And, and both ways, it goes both ways. Just because you're at home 
with your family, you absolutely should not lose your fucking bearing and not be able to control and regulate your emotions. It means having discipline and ethics in all areas of life and living by those that discipline and ethics no matter what. It's about how you conduct yourself on a daily basis, on and off duty, personally, professionally, when you're by yourself, when you're with a crowd, when you're with your family, when you're with your team and coworkers. It doesn't matter. And emotional discipline 100% also has to do when you're by yourself. How do you react? How do you think and use your time when you're by yourself? That's the real deepest level of emotional discipline. It's kind of easy to bullshit and cover shit up when other people are around. But when you're alone in your own head and your own thoughts, alone in an empty room, how the fuck do you react and you respond to the shit that's going on in your head? That's the, the deepest level of emotional discipline that we're talking about. And it's really just staying centered, staying centered, maintaining that bearing. Think of bearing like on a, on a, a compass. It's showing you the direction that you need to go in. It's figuring out your position or your situation relative to, to the surroundings, relative to the environment. That's what a, the bearing on a compass is. It's showing you the direction you need to go, the trajectory you need to go in to get to where you need to be, to get to that goal, to get to that destination, to get to that outcome, that destiny, whatever it is the fuck you're looking for. That's what, where your bearing is set, sending you. That's where emotional discipline means maintaining your bearing. When I teach this in an actual full course, when I'm, when I'm talking to different companies or doing presentations and speaking on stage, and I talk about this, we call it staying in the green. It's a full chart we do here for a podcast. We're going to give you the podcast version of this, but it's called staying in the green. That's what maintaining your bearing is. That's what this whole and you can even say maintaining your balance. If it clicks better in your head, again, I don't really like the word balance. Balance to me is boring. Balance is average. It's mediocre. But for this, to get the context of it, it is a form of balance, if you want to say it, or a form of synergy. But it really, what emotional discipline really is, is self-regulation, regulating your emotions, not overreacting and getting all crazy and worked up over shit. Like you need to be able, you need to have the skill of cutting the peaks and valleys in life. The good, the bad, not getting overly excited when good shit happens, not getting overly down and defeated and, and negative and whatever, depressed when shit goes wrong. That's what's staying in the green is that middle section, that maintaining your bearing, that military bearing. Cut the peaks and valleys, cut those highs and lows. Because when you get overly high, we call that being in the blue. And when you get overly high, that's when you get complacent. You're just cruising along. You're going through the motions because things may be going your way and you're getting complacent and complacency freaking kills. And below that level of the green, above it's the blue, below it is the red. That's when you're just making irrational decisions. Like whenever I'm in a group speaking in person, I'm up on stage and I'll ask who here has ever punched a hole in the wall. And there's been times where it's over 50% of the crowd, never less than 20%. And that's the people who are admitting it. And some of them are raising their hands like this, really short, and like, no, motherfucker, good or bad, you put your hand in the air, you take accountability for the shit you've done. How many of you punch a hole in the wall? And it's always a large amount of people. And I asked them, let me ask you something. When you were balling up that fist, and you were looking at that wall, and first of all, I ask, what was, in, what was the situation? And over 80% of the time, if it's a man who punched a hole in the wall, it had to do with their wife or a woman or, and money. And wh- I'll ask them, when you, when you punch that hole in the wall, did you consciously ball your fist up? Say, I'm going to go walk over to that wall. I'm going to put my fist through and I'm going to make a hole in that wall. And they say, hell no, because that's when they go into the red. That's below that center, below that center where the bearing is in that red, those, those, those valleys. And there's zero control of your emotions in those valleys. There's also zero, zero control of your emotions in the peaks when you're overly high and those dopamine hits are coming. You're going after those vices. And there's vices both in the blue and in the red, but vices in the highs, the peaks, and in the valleys. There's vices both directions. But that motherfucker that punched a hole in the wall and didn't, didn't consciously say, I'm going to go punch a hole in the wall. He was not in control. He was not regulating his emotions when he punched that freaking hole in the wall. You know, the largest lottery winner ever in history, the solo lottery winner was $325 I think, $25 million for one lottery winner. I think it was Andrew Whitaker was his name. And 18 months after he won that lottery, and this was the, those mega millions where usually when you win that, this, that amount of money, it's like 30 or 40 people splitting it. This is the largest ever solo lottery winner in United States history. 18 months 
after he won that lottery, $325 million. 18 months later, he said he wished he would have ripped up the winning lottery ticket. There's a, a picture that goes around of him with a, a few women in his life. His, one was like his wife and his niece or his daughter, granddaughter. I don't remember the, the details of it. doesn't matter, but I know two people in the picture at the, at, within 18 months were dead because he felt after he won it, he started making, started getting complacent, complacent in his life, complacent in his relationships, and he started making irrational decisions. He was living in those peaks and valleys, not even visiting the middle, not even visiting that section of bearing, of center, of control, had zero emotional discipline. And there were two close family members of his that were dead within 18 months. I don't remember if it was overdose, suicide, whatever it is, doesn't matter, but you get the point. Do you know that that something like over 75% of lottery winners or even higher than that, I think over 80% of lottery winners, after they win the lottery of a million dollars or more, they go bankrupt, either at least back to the level of their means of living or bankrupt within something like two to three years. Because if you sucked at living life before you had money, or if you sucked with your money at managing your money before you had money, all you're going to do when you get more of it is suck at it more and suck at it worse. You're going to have the same level of sucking because you, they don't have control of their emotions. They win that and they get even worse because they lose control of their emotions. They, they start burning bridges and, and start making those irrational decisions that we're talking about. And they get complacent in life, in health, in fitness, in, in with, their, with their family, with work even. Get complacent in, in what they do with their money and how they even deal with their money, how they invest their money. And they get complacent. That is complacency kills up at the peaks. It's irrational decisions down there in the valleys. Now, there's a, a, a quote from, it was Viktor Frankl from A Man's Search for Meaning. If you haven't read the book, A Man's Search for Meaning, that is mandatory reading. I'm giving that as homework here on the Steve Eckert Show to go read that freaking book, A Man's Search for Meaning from Viktor Frankl. He was a Austrian psychiatrist who survived something like four or five different concentration camps during World War II and actually wrote the book, A Man's Search for Meaning, on little scratch pieces of, of toilet paper while he was in the concentration camps and the guards found it and he rewrote it again and he actually based his entire practice and his entire w- way of analyzing things and actually finding the meaning of life. It's called a man's search for meaning. He did that while uh, in a concentration camp, but we lose our shit and can't control our emotions when someone cuts us off in traffic or you get a flat tire or you get fired from a job or whatever else. You lose a deal. You don't close a sale. Like it's time to level the fuck up. It's time to start controlling your damn emotions and stop letting your emotions control you. So talking about emotional discipline, this is just a couple of months ago. This happened here in a local gym. So we homeschool our kids. We call it home life because we're really teaching them how to live life, not just schooling. And there was a, we were working out together in the gym, in, in the commercial gym one day. And I'm spotting Tyson up on the pull-ups. My son Tyson, he's doing pull-ups. And my back is kind of to the walkway that's in between all the machines. And some dude's walking by and he kind of shoulder checks me and, and knocks, me a li- knocks me a little bit, like bumps me where my footing is like wobbly. And I'm like, whatever, he's, he's looking down the floor. He's got his headphones on. I'm like, all right, whatever. Maybe he's just not paying attention, didn't realize that he's just swinging. He bumped into me, whatever. There was no excuse me, no nothing. He just kept walking. I'm like, all right, let it slide. No big deal. Two minutes later, I'm now facing that lane where he walked through and my wife is sitting there in that same lane with her back to the lane where he's walking through, he walks through the same place, walks through the same way and gives her just as strong of a shoulder check. I'm like, what the fuck? All right, this is obviously wasn't an accident. This is something intentional about this. This is whatever. So I'm sitting there. He clearly did it and he keeps walking. Now he bumped into me, then bumped into my wife. This is with my, and and our son is there watching this. So now the uh, automatically I'm thinking, all right, I want to go smash this motherfucker's head in. Like I'm the thing, the thoughts that are going through my head already, the plates are bashing and this, this whole brawl and there's bars and plates slinging and there's the guts everywhere and, and, and brain splatter. Like, like someone that just like uh, 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 makes that physical contact with your family, with your wife, you go to that dark primal place, like immediately, obviously you can't react on those because you need to have emotional discipline. You need to be able to regulate your emotions, but I can't sit there and do nothing. So I can't go into the red, into those valleys, that deep, dark place. I can't go into the blue ones and just say, oh, you know, maybe having a bad day, maybe he didn't realize or make excuses and be a little bitch about it because first he did just physically bump into me and my wife and my son is sitting there watching, so I can't not do anything about it. And it really, it doesn't matter if 
the size of the guy or how big he was or if he's all roided out. It really doesn't fucking matter. The situation doesn't, you don't get to choose who the enemy is. You don't get to choose who attacks you or who tries to rob you. you unfortunately, you don't get to choose even how many of them are when they do it, but you need to know how to respond to it, react to it. So, all right, I can't go and bash a plate, a 45 pound plate on his skull like I'm picturing. I can't not do anything and just be a little bitch. So I have to, all right, how do I deal with this situation? Literally right there, before I even took another step, I pulled out my phone and I Google. I say, can you punch someone in the face for purposely bumping into you? I literally Google that. And there's a website called Lycora.com and you ask these random questions and you get this input from all these different people. It's like in this big circle, it shows you all different responses to these different random weird freaking questions like this. And like 50% of the answers were from lawyers. And they're like, yeah, you can go and do it if you want to spend more time in jail than the person who bumped into you. And then they went out to say, even if someone goes and punches your wife in the face, like bam, punches her in the face, knocks her out and walks away, walks away that you can't even go and pursue them and do anything about it. Cause now they, they're no longer a threat that all your, your only thing you could do is now is go call the police because they're not an ongoing threat. You're not in any more danger that if they're walking away, you could do nothing about it. it's fucking wild. It's crazy, but that's the way it is. I'm reading this. I'm like, all right, so the plate thing, check. Can't do that. That's down in that valley, that red. We can't go in the red. Be a little bitch. Do nothing about it. Can't do that. Be in the blue. Can't get complacent about this because, all right, I have to be the leader of my family and have some freaking respect and be the protector and the provider and make them feel safe and secure. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to have to approach this person. I'm not going to go there. So I go and I kind of nudge his arm to spin him around, to turn him around like a little light touch just to get his attention on his arm. And he turns around and I actually apologize to him. Say, I'm sorry, but I apologize, but were we in your way or something? Because I noticed you bumped into me and then you bumped into my wife. Is is everything all right or whatever? Just see what he's going to say. And he says, no, I noticed you motherfuckers were purposely getting in my way. So whatever. I'm like, are you kidding? So you purposely bump into a a woman when her back is turned? Like that's the way you deal with that? He's like, just leave me the fuck alone. I'm in the zone. He puts his headphones back on and he walks away. And that's the end of the story. No big dramatic brawl in the gym. Think about it. If and and there's a, a, a the wise philosopher Jay Z said never argue with a fool because from a distance people can't tell who is who. And I thought of that saying when this is going on because from across the gym, all someone's going to see is two knuckleheads just in, in the mud slinging dirt. Like you, two people are, are rolling in the mud. They're both just getting dirty. It doesn't matter who's at fault or whatever it is. People just see two idiots rolling there in the mud. And I was actually waiting pretty close to the through the process of getting a CCW here in California with a concealed carry permit for a firearm and any kind of incident like that is going to prevent you or at least delay you from getting it done. So have to have emotional discipline. So to me, that was a win win. And I turned that into lessons and discussions with the family and with my son show my son how does a man how a man should react really. um, Yeah, the primal instinct is like, all right, you're going to go fight this motherfucker. You're going to bash his head in. But then there's just two idiots brawling in a gym. But no, I'm going to show my son how a man really should act, not how a man might want to act. We all have that dark passenger inside of us, that fucking beast, that monster. We need to know how to control that monster. That is the ultimate emotional discipline. Knowing how to control that monster, that beast, that dark passion that's in you as a man, that's testosterone fueled, especially in the gym and you're, you're flowing. That is the ultimate level of emotional discipline of self-regulation. So that, that quote by Jay-Z popped in my head and I'm a freak with quotes. So I dug deeper and it went to, to Mark Twain. He said, never argue with a fool. Onlookers may not be able to tell the difference. And I dug even deeper and deeper and it goes all the way back to the Bible. Pretty much all personal development that you come up with, that you hear about in any books or from any experts and guru all go back to thousands of years ago to where dudes were wearing sandals and robes running around. And, and back in the Bible, they said, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be just like him. Like, holy shit. Like they knew 2000 years ago that there's going to be some dipshit in a gym who's bumping into people and you're going to need to know how to deal with it, how to respond to it rather than react. That's all I did is respond to it. There needed to be a response. I couldn't be a little bitch. And it doesn't matter if it was a mountain of a man or a little midget, a little mighty mouse. It doesn't matter. Like something needs to be get, to get done to show my son How does a man react in this situation with his family there, especially right there with his family in front of his family? How does he be that protector and keep them feeling safe and secure and continue having respect for him? 
Imagine if I would have said, no, you know what? He's probably just having a bad day and this and that. I'm not going to bother about it. He's not bothering us anymore. He's over there now. We're almost done. Imagine I did that. I would have a much lower level of respect from my, my family, from my kids, if I did some bullshit like that. That's the blue. That's the bitch. That's the, the complacency. I also would have probably a lot less respect if I went into the red, went to that dark passenger zone where it just goes primal. Yeah, they would have been like, oh, that's pretty cool. Watch that is whooping someone's ass. But then when I'm in jail and they're missing their uh, birthday parties or whatever else because I'm in jail or because I have to go to court because of this stupid fucking thing, it wouldn't be so cool then. It would be cool for a second. Cool little quick video put on the internet, but it wouldn't be cool in the long term when a year later you're still going to court for some dumb ass that bumps into you in the gym. And it turned into to teaching lessons for the kids, telling them, you know what? This, this, this person probably sees a family and together and healthy and happy and having fun and laughing. And there's probably some dark traumatic experience that this person went through or had gone through or something. And they see this and they don't, they, they can't take it. And it's, they have so much resentment for their own life, for their own fuck ups or failures or childhood or who knows what. And they can't stand to see that. And the only way they know how to do it is just react and, and overreact and do shit like stupid shit, like bumping into a woman when his back is turned, like shoulder checking her like you're in a fucking hockey game. In an alternate world or the old me, oh man, that would have been a little bit of a different ending to this story. Just an eensy bit different ending to that story. But we'll save that for another day, but I'm sure you can use your imagination. But perception is reality. If people see two idiots rolling around in the gym, they say, oh, look, there's two idiots rolling around the gym, probably fighting over a bench or a little elliptical machine because I wanted to use the elliptical and you're on there for too long at the 30 minute limit and you're on there for 35 minutes or some bullshit like that. Perception is reality. It'd be two fools rolling around the mud. There was a time when R. Kelly was accused of doing some horrible things with like minors, with, with children, disgusting despicable things he was accused of. He was on a live interview on TV and they're asking him about it. And just from the conversation, he gets up and starts screaming live on TV and starts causing this big scene about it. Now, just automatically, when you see a scene like that, he went straight to the red, straight to the red, zero control of his fucking emotions. And whether or not he was guilty, which I'm pretty sure I don't even know. I never followed up on the story. I don't even want to know the details of the story. I'm pretty sure he ended up being found guilty and is in jail for it. Don't know or not. But whether or not he was guilty, just the fact of that type of reaction, perception is reality. All you have to do is see the video of that, not even hear a word, not even know what they're talking about, and you're like, oh, that dude's fucking guilty, just for him not being able to control his emotions, and I'm pretty sure he was guilty, so perception is reality, and a lot of times, perception literally is reality, and what it looks like is what it seems, but sometimes it might just be someone that can't control their emotions, and it's not even what it seems, but just looks like that that's reality because they have zero of control of their emotions. Like most, like a good percentage of fucking people, especially men these days, just talking mostly specifically about men here. And, and, and this is what my role in the project, we run the project, the personal development program for men here in, in, in California. My role is to bring that chaos to them so they can learn to regulate their emotions, to control their emotions so that when some douchebag does smash into them in the gym and is a rude prick about it and doesn't even, doesn't even apologize or acknowledge that he's wrong, that you still know how to react or respond and you still know how to deal with that situation as your highest self, as your role model with a role model mindset and using that, then weaponizing that situation and using it to, to teach your kids, to give examples and lessons to your kids and even connect your kids more. Like We talk about that moment for months after this happened. There's a, another time, a similar, similar situation, just more online. So back when I had my gyms in New York, there was a, a gentleman who wanted to be a kickboxing instructor, a part-time kickboxing instructor for just teach a couple classes. He was a, a member and said how it saved his life in the gym and this and that. He was there for six months and it really changed his life. And he wanted to give back and just teach one or two classes a week. Now, I knew the temperament and I knew in my gut feeling, not probably a good idea, probably a bad idea, but said, you know what? We're going to give the benefit of the doubt. We're going to go through the full screening process of what we do to hire someone. doesn't matter if we know someone. doesn't matter if they're a member. We're going to go through the full screening process. We have a, a several interview process doing our due diligence to make sure someone's a good culture fit, make sure someone's going to fit the team in what we do in the gym. So in his very first interview starts cursing, snapping, because we ask a lot of tough questions and he didn't respond well 
to that hot seat, to those tough questions, uh, situational questions. How would you react to this? How would you respond to this? What would you do if this and this happened? And it turned out mentioning one of our members and talking about, uh, it just was a horrible situation. And we said, all right, this is an obvious sign. We're not going to go forward with this individual being a, an instructor. And the days went on, the weeks went on, and we said, you know what? You can still be a member. It's just not meant, it's just not a good fit to, to work here for us. You're still welcome to be a member. Through that next seven, not even seven, three, literally like three to five days, there was a lot of toxicity going on, a lot of uh, building up, stirring the pot, a lot of bullshit, a lot of childish shit, trying to tell members to go try out other gyms and all this other stuff. And because we weren't hiring this individual, as a trainer, started to kind of stirring the pot, causing a little drama, a lot of bullshit, a lot of childish shit, junior high school shit. So I was out of town. I had to give the individual a call and I had to tell them, you know, you're now going to have to, if you've never fired a client before, you should. Again, whatever your industry and whatever business you're in, there is a time to fire a client. And so I had to fire this person as a client and they snapped and threatened me and all this other stuff, threatened me, talk shit about my wife, talk shit about my daughter who was like four or five years old at the time, threatening and doing videos and posts and all that. And you know, I didn't know about any of this because the second I hung up that phone, the greatest invention on social media, block and delete motherfucker, haven't heard a sound from that individual now in 10 years or however long it's been. Now, people are telling me, well, what are you going to do? He's threatening you. He's doing this. He's going to trying to steal your clients and all this other stuff. So what am I going to do is I'm going to continue being fucking awesome. I'm going to continue marching forward, continue changing lives, continue helping people lose tens of thousands of pounds, continue making millions of dollars, continue being fucking awesome, continue being a role model to my kids because when I'm going to the internet and say, hey, man, I'm going to kick your ass and all this other stuff, all this other bullshit. And that's that, that's the same situation as the other one, like two people talking shit, like people from a distance can't tell who is who when there's two idiots just arguing over nonsense. And that's emotional discipline, being able to control your emotions. Even I was getting threats or there were threats. I didn't know about it because it was blocked and deleted. I was getting threats and talking all this shit and all this other stuff from this is from a grown man and it's just block and delete. I'm going to move on and continue to be fucking awesome. That's what I'm going to do. So let's talk about emotional discipline when it comes to sports. And I want to say specifically psychological warfare in sports. And James Garfield had a quote. He said, of course, I deprecate war, but if it's brought to my door, the bringer will find me home. That's a motherfucker that knows how to control the beast. That's a motherfucker who knows how to regulate his emotions, but how to unleash the beast when it, when it would be time. I love that saying, and it's really what psychological warfare, what using emotional discipline as a weapon in psychological warfare, in sports or in, in business, in, in combat, whatever it is. And I always ask people, who do you think is the greatest? And when it comes to what we're talking about here, this emotional discipline, who do you think is the greatest athlete ever that used emotional discipline with psychological warfare? And they'll say stuff like Michael Jordan or LeBron James or Conor McGregor and all these athletes. No, no, no. They all got it from the original. And that is Muhammad Ali. Like he knew how to push the buttons. He would push the buttons to get someone so pissed off. He'd get them into the red, get them so pissed off, get them in the ring, get them tired. Then he would go into the rope a dope where they'd get all excited. They think they have him. They'd go into the blue and get complacent, leave their guard down and blow out all their energy. And he would end up beating them. Muhammad Ali shouldn't have won. I don't even know. 20 to 30% of the fights he, he, he won. He wasn't the fastest, wasn't the strongest, wasn't the best technique, wasn't the biggest. He used emotional discipline as psychological warfare, knowing what buttons to push at his opponents, knowing how to not let his own get buttons pushed. That is a, that was a fucking superpower in, in college basketball, John Wooden, the, the, the winningest coach in college basketball history. I'm pretty, pretty sure, or one of the, definitely one of the most decorated had something like 11 undefeated seasons. I think 10 championships, something around there, whatever number. And he said he would never mope around and be down and out and depressed after a loss, even if it was for a national championship, nor would he be jumping up and down a cartwheel and all crazy for days after a win, even if it was for a national championship, because he knows that, ne- that next game, once you're on top, like what happens once you're on top? Everyone's out to get you. There's nowhere to go but down when you're at the top dog. The UFC, the, the heavyweight championship, you know, the, you know what title they give the heavyweight champion? You know what, what they call that? What they, the, the title they give that man of the UFC heavyweight champion? They call him the baddest man on the planet. 
the baddest man on the planet. Imagine you're, you're called the baddest man on the planet. You're going to, you know what happens? They get complacent. There was the longest stretch of UFC consecutive title defenses up until about two years ago or a year ago, and this is 30 years of the UFC, was two, a whopping two. Two times in a row that someone defended their heavyweight title. They would always win it, win the championship, and lose. Win it, someone else win it, and lose. Because they get the title. They're the baddest man on the planet. They think, I don't have to train as much. I'm strong. I'll just knock anyone out, and they just get destroyed eventually from getting complacent. And so, all right, let's break it down. How to maintain your bearing. How to maintain your emotional discipline. Well, in it, Marcus Aurelius, I told you a lot of all, almost all personal development goes back to dudes in, in fucking robes and sandals. Marcus Aurelius said a man following reason in all things combines relaxation with initiative and spark with composure. Like, holy fuck. If that's not staying in the green, if that's not emotional discipline definition, if I ever heard it, I love that quote, relaxation with initiative and spark with composure. So how do we use that as a system, as a philosophy? First, I, I, I always break things down into acronyms or just letters or initials. CCC means calm conquers chaos. Calm will always conquer chaos. Be the calmest motherfucker in the room. That's the one who someone's going to come to in, in an emergency is that calm motherfucker. That's not freaking out. That's not losing their shit. No one wants to be around someone that, that can't control their fucking emotions. No one's going to trust or respect that, that boss or that parent or business partner who can't control their fucking emotions. Calm will conquer chaos all the times. The next one is POP, pissed on purpose. Only getting upset when you know it's strategic, when you know it's like that the football player in the halftime that 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 throw slams the the Gatorade jug all over the place and, and yelling at the team because he knows the buttons it takes to push to get the team to come out and perform better in that second half. The next is DDD. Discipline defeats distraction. Problems usually with getting losing control of your emotions is being distracted, getting caught up in the mix instead of saying disciplined and having boundaries and saying no to shit you know you should be saying no to and not taking on too much, not getting overwhelmed, not getting burnt out. Next one is FIO, figure it out. Figure it the fuck out. Have belief in your ability and the confidence to figure shit out no matter what gets thrown your way. And of course, this stuff, yeah, it sounds easy, but it's not freaking easy. Then NNA is no negativity allowed. Not allowing any negativity into your life, no matter who, where it's coming from. Not from people or places or an environment. And, and when I say people, I mean anyone. Not even your own family. Not your own parents. No negativity allowed. Not from the news. Not from social media. Not letting that bullshit drag you down. Not getting all butthurt and offended when some people talk on the internet and believe bad comments on your post that you thought was so cool. And then you realize that, that people, that people don't take everything so serious and they get offended and hurt by stuff. Not letting that shit drag you down. Like it's safe from experience because it happens every fucking day. It happens right now. People will find something to talk about. about. If, if, if Mother Teresa was around today, she would get hated on the internet. People will always find something to say. No matter what you say, no matter what you're doing, they will always find something to say. No negativity allowed. And we kind of started this off with, with Viktor Frankl from A Man's Search for Meaning. We're going to finish it with Viktor Frankl. He said, when we are no longer able to change a situation, we are, we are challenged to change ourselves. That's how you ultimately control your emotions. That's how you ultimately have emotional discipline. Say that again. When we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. It's not about the situation. It's not about the other person. It's not about the, whatever else. It's about you. You changing yourself to control your emotions, to control the situation, to maintain your bearing, just like we started off with the military bearing. Listen, you, let, you would not let someone physically dominate you and throw you around and push you around. You even have on your little, your, little, your little fruit phones, you have your little cases that keep it nice and protected. You have car insurance on your car. You keep all that stuff safe, everything around you safe and protected. But then why the fuck do you let people control your mind and your emotions by pushing your buttons when you know what your buttons are? When you know what your buttons are, it's a lot easier to not let them get pushed. You need that self-awareness to, and that, that's a huge part of having this emotional discipline. So stop letting people push your buttons, cut those strings, those puppet strings of letting people control it and take back control. Use this as a system, just thinking. It's in the blue, in the green, in the red. It's such an easy way to give feedback, to check yourself when you're starting to lose it, when you're starting to get complacent, you're starting to make irrational decisions. Get back into the green, emotional discipline, maintain your freaking bearing. 
If this message has helped you or resonated with you, make sure you like, subscribe to the channel, share this with whoever needs to hear a message about controlling their emotions, regulating their emotions. I'm sure lots of you know plenty of people, probably your own close family members, even your spouse might need to hear something about this. Go share this with them. Comment down below. Make sure you subscribe. I will see you next time on the Steve Eckert Show podcast. And in case no one told you yet today, you are fucking awesome. No excuses. 